Welcome everybody. This is uh, this is the fifth of our series on um, the name above every name. Um, it looks as though there's perhaps a few new people joining us, um, so we have to give some context of what we've been looking at. Um, part of looking at the uh, the name above every name and looking at the name of Jesus, we've been making a connection back to Numbers chapter 6, uh, verses 24 to 26, which is such a well-known uh, blessing that we know, which was particularly a blessing that was upon um, the priesthood, upon the sons of Aaron, and they were actually to pronounce this blessing upon the children of Israel. The Lord bless thee, keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The next verse says in verse 27, which we often miss out, in doing so, they will put my name, God says, upon my people. So there's something very important about this blessing. Um, this blessing constituted the name or represented the name of God upon the children of Israel. Um, and the parts of this blessing, uh, what we've been looking at, have a counterpart in the titles that are given of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9. So here's the four parts of the blessing of number six we've been looking at. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and the Lord give thee peace. And what we've been looking at is, is they correlate um, with the name that is going to be given to the Emmanuel child, the son that is going to come, whose name will be called a wonderful counsellor. In that uh, connection to the Lord bless thee and keep thee is, the idea behind Wonderful Counselor is that of a counselor, guider, advisor, and the word for keep is the same word which is used for the law. And God blessed the people with wonderful instructions. He gave them a law which helped to keep them in the way, which separated from the nations. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee is when you see behind the law giver and you see the um, the beauty or behind the law, sorry, and you see the law giver, um, the effect of that law and that counsel was such that the character of God begins to shine. And this is the power of Almighty God coming upon us. The elevation, Lord, lift up his countenance is about recognition. It's about seeing that light and then elevating um, to a different state of glory, which is seen in the everlasting Father, and obviously we're looking to a Prince of Peace. So that's a very sort of quick summary of uh, the names we've been looking at. We also made connection back to the story of Genesis and looking at where names first appear. And what we saw was that, um, and this was an exercise we all did together, was that um, God only in the Genesis record of, of the first couple of chapters, only names specifically five different things. He names land and sea, um, and he named it by separating. So he elevated the land out of the sea and he separated it. And um, there's a great connection there with the natural establishment of the state of Israel. It is Israel, the earth, out of the sea of nations, and the setting of boundaries upon the earth. Then he also named uh, night and day, again separation, and this was about the new covenant, which um, correlates to the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. He then elevates and he separates uh, the firmaments, the waters below with the waters above, calling the waters above sky or firmament above and that correlates to the new life lift up his countenance upon thee so those are the only five things mentioned in the first couple of cha uh, chapters of genesis that are named specifically named by god 
But in reality, it's it's only three things that is being focused. The only reason that land is named uh, or that sea is named, it's to separate and elevate the land because the sea was always there, wasn't it? Genesis 1, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and the waters covered the earth. So the sea was always there, but God separated and um, in doing so, he made a separation calling the, uh, the waters sea and calling the land land. Um, the same thing with night and day. Darkness was over. Darkness was already there. But he separated these two things, calling darkness night and uh, calling the light day. Same again with the firmaments. He separated the firmaments above. So in reality, the focus is on land, day, and the firmament above, the three things, which are part of his covenant of separation. Now, there's one more thing that God names in the Genesis record, but it doesn't come in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. It comes later in Genesis chapter 5, and this is what we're going to be looking at in terms of the fourth part of God's covenant and the fourth part of the blessing of Numbers chapter 6. And that is, when you read carefully Genesis chapter 5, it says this is the book of the generations of Adam when God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and named them man or Adam. And, and there's something really interesting in this, is that when God first created Adam and Eve, he gave them both. He gave them both the, uh, the title of Adam. So the King James Version says male and female created them and he blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So in, in this establishment of man and woman, they were, they were a singular unit that God called them. It was only man or Adam that called Eve woman out of man. And Adam said because she was taken out of man that he named her woman. But when God first created them, he named them both Adam. And this is a real key to our story of peace because behind this phrase of peace is this concept of unity. It's the concept of oneness. And we'll look at that particularly in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the idea behind the Hebrew word shalom. So as far as the children of Israel go, when Moses gave this blessing of of peace upon them, that the Lord bring peace. The children of Israel um, may have been able to think back into history, into their stories of where this concept of peace was really first seen quite powerfully. And it comes in the story that we, um, we should be reasonably familiar with of Genesis 14. It's not really, when you look at it, a particularly um, particular peaceful story. If you follow through the story of um, Genesis 14, it's about Abraham going to war and a great battle and fighting and plunder between various kings that set themselves against the Canaanite kings and, um, and they fight against the two Canaanite kings of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, of course, Abraham's, lot gets taken, uh, Abraham's nephew Lot family gets taken captive and so Abraham goes on a rescue mission and in the rescue mission he has this great victory and defeat of these Canaanite kings and he comes back after his um, victory against these Canaanite kings having rescued his family being reunited with his family and then he comes across two kings and the story of Genesis 14 is really the tale of two kings, quite different kings. One, of course, um, is the king of Sodom, 
um, actually in this record, someone might be able to tell me. I, I, it appears the King of Sodom already, has already fallen and died in the slime pits and then reappears later on. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has any answer to that. I, I get the feeling that maybe this uh, King of Sodom that meets Abraham is actually heir to the throne, heir to his father, because his father's already died in this battle. But that's a side. Um, anyway, what you find with the king of Sodom, when he comes out to meet Abraham, um, Abraham has delivered him and given this great victory, and he comes almost with demands to Abraham. He says what he wants from Abraham is that Abraham give him all the people. You can keep the money, but I want the people. And, of course, the story is Abraham doesn't want to touch anything of the king of Sodom. So. The king of Sodom is making demands upon Abraham, whereas Melchizedek is coming out to meet Abraham and he's bearing gifts. He brings bread and wine. And Melchizedek is, is an interesting character, isn't he? He is, first of all, known as Melchizedek, king of righteousness, Malchai. King, Zedek, righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. But the record also says that he's the king of Salem, king of peace. So he's king of righteousness and king of peace. And when you come to the record of Genesis chapter 4, Melchizedek is under no illusion as to where this victory of Abraham comes from. Because he blesses Abraham and he says in verse um, 19, he blessed Abraham and said, blessed be Abraham by the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, blessed be the most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So Melchizedek is very clear that this victory is being wrought by God. And of course, he's also unique in the sense that he's a high priest. So for the children of Israel, the understanding or the concept of uh, peace perhaps came first of all through the story of Melchizedek. And for us, that's where we're going to start because when you look at the Hebrew word for peace, Shalom. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It has to do with um, it has to do with restoration of relationships. Um, and and that's that's what's behind the Hebrew word to restore. It's the sense of well-being and security. Um. When, when we use the term peace, it can be used in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, the parents can um, be wanting peace from their teenager playing the drums in the room next door. Um, a shopkeeper can be wanting peace because he's, um, he's stressed about paying his financial bills and what he's really wanting is prosperity. Um, so, the, the English word for peace is a little bit loose, if you like. The Hebrew word shalom is, is quite a strong word, speaking of an eternal relationship. Um, and, and it's derived from um, the word shalem, which has the idea of um, physical, emotional, or spiritual wholeness. And it includes a, birth, a person's bodily health, and well-being, and they are, are never really experienced separately. So when you look at the story of Jesus, um, he, he bestowed real blessings upon people for the restoration of true relationships. He spoke to people that were disenfranchised and disinherited from their societies or from their religious communities, and he reached out to those people and he reconnected them with this um, spirit of um, true relationships, right relationships. Um, I'm 
might just find a uh, way we can. There we go. Somebody's already done that. Okay. Um. So so this is the idea of of peace. Now, in, in order to establish true relationships, um, sometimes it doesn't come about in quite the way we might understand peace in the English. And, and the story of Melchizedek and Abraham is, is the classic example. The end result of the story of Abraham or in the, in the Battle of the Kings in Genesis 14 was the restoration of Lot. You know, he had fallen out with Lot, and this was Abraham redeeming Lot and saving Lot um, and bringing him back into a restored relationship. But in order to do that, there was enormous conflict, huge conflict. In fact, if you look at the story of Abraham's life, Genesis 14 is, is the greatest um, physical battle and confrontation that Abraham has um, in terms of a physical battle. The greatest emotional battle came when he went to offer up Isaac. But again, both of those situations ended in peace, shalom. They ended into a restored relationship of family. And that's really the idea behind this Hebrew word for peace. So, so Jesus, for instance, says, do not think, uh, Matthew chapter 10, that I came to bring peace on the earth, which is kind of unusual. He says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter, mother, a mother, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be those of his own house. And, and in this statement of Jesus, you can see that it, it had uh, peace is directly tied in with relationships, family relationships. And because Jesus' teaching was actually going to divide families, there was not going to be peace. But yet when you come to the end of Jesus' ministry with the disciples, he makes this incredible, most beautiful saying, and I think we will come back to this in our next study. Um, he says to the disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. So, um, so he, he goes on to say, in the world you will have trouble, but don't be afraid, for I have overcome the world. And again, you can see in this story of peace, there is both conflict and, and the battle that's been won, um, and peace within a troubled time. So I thought that's um, that's kind of important just to lay the foundation of, of this idea of God's peace coming upon us. Um, what's interesting when you when you look at the um, this uh, story of peace, perhaps one of the greatest examples again, and I think I've got my slides out of order sorry, <laughs> is um, the story of Passover. So when you think about the story of Passover, um, it's a story in which the children of Israel were protected in their homes, in their families, set apart in their families in an environment of peace, in a true relationship with God because they had the sprinkled blood over their doorposts. But outside, of their um, houses, there was um, a terrible, horrific uh, thing that was going on. And it involved, of course, a destroying angel. And this, this, this story of Passover, I think, um, really portrays the story of godly peace in trouble and, and the story of of a true relationship with God in times of turmoil. Now, the children of Israel, of course, they would have they would have understood this. And when uh, God said to them through Aaron, "The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make His face to shine upon thee 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace, so shall I put my name on the children of Israel. It was very much like putting the blood on the doors of their houses. That peace which they had was at a time of great turmoil. Um, Passover, by the way, is something which occurs over and over again in our story. And I can say I've got this slide out of order, but I'll show it to you now because in the story of um, our connection in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah is writing at a time when right in the middle of one of the greatest conflicts Israel ever faced, that of the Assyrian army coming down with all its power. And in a real sense, Israel got shut up in Jerusalem, just like Passover. They got completely shut up, and outside was the enemy, and it was a terrifying time. But what happened, of course, in one night, in one single night, um, an angel, like in the story of the Passover, a destroying angel came forth and wiped out all the Assyrians in one night. And there's evidence within Isaiah's record that this all happened at the time of a Passover. Remember, Hezekiah started, his reign started with a Passover. Um, and here's some of the connections. In Isaiah chapter 30, which uh, perhaps you could look at, Isaiah chapter 30, which relates to the destruction of the Assyrian. In verse 29 of Isaiah chapter 30, it says, You will have a song in the night when a holy feast is kept, gladness of heart, when one sets out a sound of a flute, and as the mountain of the, uh, the Lord to the rock of Israel. And the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard, and a descending blow of his arm shall be furious anger, and a flame of a devouring fire, and a cloud voice, and storms of hailstones, and the Assyrians will be terror-stricken at the voice of the Lord when he strikes with his rod and the stroke of his appointed staff that the Lord lays upon him. So in the context of the destruction of the Assyrian in one night, it says in verse 29 that they would have a song in the night, as when a holy solemnity is kept. Um, again, there's a, a little bit of evidence that when Sennacherib uh, surrounded Jerusalem and tried to get Hezekiah to capitulate and to give up um, that the people remained resolute and what was going on in the city was they were keeping the Passover and they were actually singing and the voice of the song was heard over the city walls and Rav Shaker, who was standing out there could not comprehend and that's why he was saying where is this trust Later, of course, there is the story of um, Sennacherib who wrote the tale of Prism, um, which is in the British Museum, and it says Hezekiah, he shut up in Jerusalem like a caged bird. And, and maybe that's a reference to the fact that, you know, all he could hear from outside the city walls was like this canary chirping. The, the birds were singing. And inside the city and amongst this great fear and anxiety, of what was outside the walls with this army, the people completely trusted in God and they were singing and they were keeping the Passover on the night, the very night that the Assyrians were destroyed. Again, it says, the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, it shall show forth lightning, and the Assyrian will, beaten down, will be beaten down with a rod. Um, Uh, so Jesus says, I have told you these things that you might have peace. In the world you have trouble, but I have overcome the world. Now see, so this is this is very much the picture of Passover. So now I've got the slides back in order. 
here's, um, here's the picture of Passover. Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. God will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house and smite you. So on the one hand, you've got the destroyer outside and inside the doors of the houses, you have peace. You have this beautiful picture of a family together sharing a meal um, and being totally protected from what's taking place outside. Now, um, I, I can't prove this, but I like to believe that the angel, the destroying angel, which goes forth and destroys all the firstborn of Israel, of Egypt, sorry, was in fact um, the archangel Michael. And, and part of the reason why is that Michael, of course, is called in the record the great prince who stands for the children of thy people. And you remember when Joshua comes forward into the land, Joshua chapter 5, he meets an angel there as he's about to go um, uh, to fight against the people of the land in the land of Canaan. And when he meets the angel, he challenges the angel because he's going forth in all his power and all his might. He's charging forward. And notice the context of when he meets the angel. Verse 10. It says that they were keeping the Passover. They kept the Passover when they came into the land and then the very next event, verse 13, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. A man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. So context-wise, there's Passover and there you've got an angel with a drawn sword. Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, no, neither. And Joshua was like, huh? He says, I am here as the commander of the army of the Lord. Now, the word for, um, for commander is the very word that is used in Isaiah chapter 9 for the word prince, a prince of peace the chief captain. So here is an angel with a sword drawn around the time of the Feast of Passover, and he says, I am the captain. I am the captain of God's army. In the, in the word for prince, you may wonder why of Jesus, it calls him the prince of peace and not the king of peace. And I kind of liken it like this. When you looked at the story of Melchizedek, and the story of Sodom, you see Melchizedek comes out after the battle. The king of peace, the king of righteousness, comes out after the battle. In this story we see in Joshua chapter 5 and in the story of the Passover, you see the angel or the captain leading the armies. And the word for a prince is a commander or a leader. So when you read that he should be called the prince of peace, it's the idea of a commander of peace. He is the one who is the authority of peace, which you see in Jesus' life when he calms the storm. And the disciples said, who is this that can even command the storm that they should be still? Jesus is the one that is in the midst of the storm. He's in the midst of the battle. He will lead the commanding armies. So when you see this concept of the prince, you see a commander who's bringing peace, but he brings it with the sword. Um, and all of this happened in context with Isaiah, which, again, see my slides were completely out of, out of order here. I suddenly got them a bit muddled up where um, Isaiah 31 would say the Assyrian would fall by a sword, but not of man, a sword not of man shall devour him. And just like Joshua, Joshua had to learn that his battle was not going to be his fight. Just like Melchizedek had to come out with Abraham to see that his battle was, uh, his victory over the kings of Canaan was not his victory. Melchizedek says, blessed 
is the most high God which has delivered these enemies into your hands. And just like in the days of Isaiah, the great victory was going to be one where no one had to lift the sword. No one did anything. There was n- n- The fight was won for them in a single night, just like Passover. The angel, Michael, I believe, because he's the archangel commanding the armies and he's powerful, Michael, the archangel, comes and defeats the Assyrian in, an, in one night. So Michael, the great prince, who stands for the children of his people. I believe that this is, you know, a reference pointing forward to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be the Michael in the age to come to fight for the children of his people. He will be the commander of the armies. Um, But as it says in Daniel chapter 12, there will be a time of trouble such as never was um, when this battle takes place. Daniel chapter 12, at that time shall Michael, the great prince who was in charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation nor to that time. But your people will be delivered everyone whose name is found written in the dust in the book <laughs> sorry many that sleep in the dust shall awake many that found written in the book shall be saved so this is the work of michael the great prince it is the work of the lord jesus christ who is the prince of peace but the peace comes through a great battle And when you find the story of Michael, it happens all the time, doesn't it? So when you get to Revelation, who is it that fights and defeats the dragon? So Revelation chapter 12, it says, and Michael and the angels fought and defeated the dragon, that old serpent called sin and death. So Michael is the great uh, captain of the army who deals a blow towards the dragon and the dragon is cast down. When you compare that to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews chapter 2 that through death, Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus is the one that has dealt the blow to sin and death. He is the one that has conquered sin and death. And if you compare that, of course, with Revelation 12, that means that you've got an identification of who Michael is, the great prince, the great prince who deals the savage blow against the enemies of God, but in doing so brings peace. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that we are only a few days out from Passover, um, three days, really. Passover starts on Wednesday. um, Jew, the Jews today said um, are saying this is perhaps um, the first time in modern Jewish history since the establishment of the nation in 1948 when they will keep the Passover as per the truest sense that it was first established in Exodus chapter 12 where every family keeps the Passover separate in their own bubbles alone. And and there's a unique situation that is happening in the next few days with Passover. For us, brothers and sisters, we are in exactly the same situation. We have been separated in our families on our own. And outside, there is this virulent illness which has swept the world and continues to sweep the world. And the powers and the leaders of this day have claimed that they will defeat this virus. Donald Trump has made it very clear that he wants to defeat coronavirus and will make sure that he gets the credit for defeating the coronavirus. 
He said he wanted to defeat the coronavirus by Easter or Passover. So Donald Trump will defeat the coronavirus by Passover. Hmm. It'll be a really rude awakening for everyone. The invisible enemy, as I call it, once it's defeated, we get the economy back. Uh, it's going to all come back to us very quickly. You know, this trillion dollar stimulus. So Donald Trump is going to defeat this virus and, and everything's going to be all right. Sadly, um, you know, I was interested to listen this morning to the Queen's um, State of the Nation speech, which she doesn't do very often. She's only actually done it um, in wartime. Um, to hear what she had to say to Britain, to the people of Britain, um, concerning this troubling time period. Um, obviously, the Queen has a lot of advisors in terms of writing these things, and I'm not quite sure if um, this would have been exactly her words or her thoughts, um, but I found an interesting comparison to the Queen's speech um, today, that she gave today, compared to her wartime speech. And I want to share that with you because you'll, I think you'll see something absolutely remarkable in terms of our study that we're looking at from Numbers chapter 6, the name above every name, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Here's the Queen's speech um, that she gave back in 1957. When we have won through to an enduring peace, shall we be free to work unhindered for the greater happiness and well being of all mankind? We put our trust in God, who is our refuge and strength in all times of trouble. I pray with all my heart that He may bless and guide and keep you always. That was the Queen's speech in 1957, where she completely acknowledges in her speech the power of God um, in these events to bring peace as the only source to bring peace. Her speech this morning was a stark contrast to her speech given some, sorry, yeah, 1940, some 50-something some 50 years ago. Seven years ago. While we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavor, using the great advances of science and our instinctive compassion to heal. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. You notice that in her speech this morning, she gave uh, recognition to the advances of modern science and our ability as humans to show compassion to defeat this virus and that we will succeed and that recognition of that success will come upon every one of us. She did mention at one point in her speech that in this time there is an opportunity to meditate and pray. But other than that, she never made any recognition or mention of God. And in this, I believe we're seeing a significant change in the way things were back in the days of the war. Sorry, I've got some going on on my computer. And, and I think that's why we are sitting at the edge of Christ's return, and that's why I don't think we're anywhere near the defeating of this virus, because whilst Donald Trump and the leaders and the powers that be are saying that we will defeat this virus through modern science and through a united effort, um, I think God is not being glorified. 
And so as we um, stay inside our bubbles, um, remember these words in Isaiah chapter 26. So in Isaiah chapter 26, this is the story of the, um, the defeat of Sennacherib and his armies. It's a picture of um, Hezekiah shut up in Jerusalem as, as, the, uh, as the city of peace, the city of the great king. And in this story, Sennacherib is outside trying to put an end to the city. And in this incredible um, picture of Isaiah chapter 26 is my favorite verse. Verse one, we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. He is the Prince of Peace. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter therein and keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you trust in the lord forever for in the lord is an everlasting rock and he has humbled the inhabitants of the height and the lofty city he lays it low to the ground and casts it to the dust his foot tramples the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. Whereas the path of the righteous is level and makes level the way of the righteous. The path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and your remembrance is the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, then the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And then verse 20, come my people, enter into the chambers, shut your doors behind you and hide yourself for a little while. That's the picture of Passover. Come my people, enter into your chambers, enter into your homes, shut your doors about you, hide yourself for a little moment, every family apart for until his fury has passed. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. Michael, the great prince, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity and the earth to disclose her blood shed upon it and he will no more cover his saying. God has been calling for repentance from the nations. This virus has come about in a time for the nations to realize their transgressions and that they have left him out of their governments, out of their control. And he's calling for repentance, but instead the leaders of the of this world are saying that they have the power to defeat this virus. There's a beautiful picture, of course, on the story on the two on the road to Emmaus, which is, I think, again, a picture of the Prince of Peace who comes and finds these two on the road to Emmaus who are disillusioned and he gives them direction and guidance and he steers them back on the path. This is the way, walk you in it, the Lord bless you and keep you. Then he opens up to them their, the word and speaks to them and it says their hearts burn within them. The Lord lift up his face upon you. And then they invited him into their home and she shared a fellowship meal with Jesus. And the Lord lifted up his countenance upon you. And then it says, and they raged back and continued in Jerusalem, worshiping and praising God in the city of peace. And three times in that record, Jesus appears and says, Shalom, my peace I give to you. And that story on the tour on the road to Emmaus is really the story of us. So we've come to our, uh, the end really of our series, which um, has looked at the individual titles found in Numbers and in Isaiah. And what we hope to do, God willing, on Wednesday, is we want to look at um, seeing all of those concepts put together in two or three places. And we're going to look at another little title of Jesus which is found in the story of Siloam 
And it's part of this whole name that is given to Jesus, the name above every name. And that's going to be um, on, the, on the subject of there's something in the water. But before I go, I thought there's one last quote I wanted to share with you. Um, and we will come back again to this quote and this concept again on Wednesday. And it's this one. Revelation 22, verse 4 and 5. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. So those things that God separated, day he called day and night he called night, they will not need the light and lamp of the sun, for the Lord God will be their light. He will lift up his countenance upon them, and they will reign or rule forever with him. So we're living in pretty uncertain times, uncertain times about um, our future in this life. We're uncertain perhaps where the economy is going to go, where our jobs are going to go. But we're not living in uncertain times when it comes to our relationship with God. We have had our uh, seen his face. And we are having his name inscribed on our forehead. Here in our bubbles, we have been separated out and that name is being written upon us. And I was looking through the paper and I saw this job application and I thought maybe as we come out of this, this is the job application we'll all apply for. Situations vacant. Multiple applications are now being received for vacancies within Millennium's New World Order Corporation. Reporting directly to the Chief Executive Commander of Peace, roles include guidance counsellors, family counsellors, welfare support officers, mus musical directors, health medical advisory and support teams. Successful applicants will be responsible for the implementation of Zion's New World Order policies and laws. Applicants will need to be able to demonstrate qualities of honesty, compassion, humility, justice, and equity. A history of peacemaking and indiscrimination will be essential to the role. Only applicants who have been baptized into his majesty's name earnestly desire the goodwill of mankind and glorification of God need apply. Degrees in Pharisaism and dogmatism will not be recognized. Remuneration will include eternal life, absolute holiness, and rulership over 10 cities. Please forward resume to the Prince of Peace, Kingdom's Way. God bless.